I thought, who better to give me a proper analysis of how term has gone than the Latin master himself, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Conservative MP for North East Somerset. Jacob, good evening and welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening. To the show. Um, tell me, just how strong and stable is Mrs May's government? It's all right. I think in politics things are rarely either as good or as bad as they seem. And that in March, Mrs May was getting enormously favourable ratings. And then that didn't translate into the landslide that people had begun to expect. But she got uh, the highest vote share since Margaret Thatcher in 1983 and more actual physical votes than Tony Blair in 1997. She's still the Prime Minister. She commands a effective majority government with the Democratic Unionists. The Cabinet is calming down and we're going away. Is it? Yes, is it I think really? it is. I think it is. I, but I, we've, we've seen, Jacob, we've seen, I mean, within a week of the Queen's speech being voted on, we've seen the Foreign Secretary and, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer publicly disagreeing on the 1% pay cap for public workers. Well, I think there's been differences of nuance rather than fundamental disagreement. I think that you may say the elastic of collective responsibility has stretched, but it hasn't been broken. That around the pay cap, there are um, some areas where people have done better than others, that there have been pay increments, there have been grade increments, and that has meant that people haven't just been receiving the 1% pay, and that there is some flexibility uh, within that. And the Chancellor is quite rightly emphasising the general point that we have to live within our means. So uh, I think because it was a febrile atmosphere, minor disagreements got blown into uh, a, an unwinding of cabinet government, and I think that was an overstatement. And certainly we're not living within our means, are we? Because we're still borrowing £50 billion pounds plus every single year. But, but perhaps the most important thing, I mean, and all of this stuff matters, but Brexit, and you were a Brexiteer, and, and indeed we uh, shared platforms during that campaign. Brexit is the most fundamental political change that we've seen for a very long time in this country. The whole object of the election was to give Mrs May a stronger hand, in Brussels with the renegotiation. I mean, with the best will in the world, the election has weakened her hand, surely. I don't think it's weakened her hand in Brussels. I think it's weakened the ability to get legislation through the House of Commons. But Brussels is used to dealing with coalition governments. Very few European governments are not coalitions. And therefore, it deals with the Prime Minister of any individual country as the Prime Minister, as long as that is the case. And therefore, I think the negotiation carries on as normal. And our position is extremely strong. If you take the customs union, uh, our leaving the customs union is a risk exclusively for continental Europe, because we protect their goods. We don't protect our goods, by and large. And therefore, they have a lot to lose if there is a difficult departure. And we have a, a min marginal amount to gain from an orderly departure. So our position is pretty strong. We should emphasize that. I think we have been so negative about our own position. And we've assumed that when the EU says it wants to negotiate uh, in a particular way or the order of negotiations, that's holy writ and we must just bow down and obey. Well, but we you could argue that. that we are, Jacob, because actually, if you look to what happened this week, Monsieur Barnier uh, seemed to be very much in charge. He set the terms upon which we negotiate, which have to be agreed before we even discuss a free trade deal. And we're going along with that. Well, but we're not. Uh, that, as you may have noticed, we've already discussed trade to some degree because trade is essential to Ireland. You can't discuss Ireland without discussing trade. And Ireland has come in the first round. And they're expecting us to set out what we intend to give them in terms of money. And we've said, no, you, you prove it. Um, show us what we actually owe you. Come up with some figures. And that's very difficult for them because our strict legal obligations, as you know very well, are nil. Article 50 makes it clear that once we've left, all obligations cease. That's absolutely right. So we have a very strong negotiating position in legal terms. Whether we want to give them some money to achieve favourable terms in other ways is a negotiating matter, but the legal starting point is incredibly strong. Now, I understand that completely, and yet, you know, look at what Monsieur Barney has done in the course of the last couple of weeks. He had Jeremy Corbyn to see him, he had Nicola Sturgeon to see him, he had Carwin Jones, the First Minister of Wales, to see him. So at the same time, we're being told we're not allowed to negotiate directly with any member state government. We're not allowed to negotiate trade with any other part of the world. And yet here he is negotiating with other 
party leaders. I mean, do you think Monsieur Barney is playing with a straight bat? Um, well, I very much doubt he's a cricketer. Um, <laughs> if he is, he plays French cricket, which is a, a rather um, mutated version of the real thing. But it's very interesting that The Times has a piece today by a senior German politician saying that he thinks Mr. Barnier wants to punish us and that this is really bad news for the EU and that that's beginning to show splits. And although we may not formally be allowed to negotiate with other member states, it's quite interesting where the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have just been, how well they've been received, that our relations with uh, other member states beyond the two power blocks of France and Germany are in many ways pretty good. And I'm sure the Foreign Office is working uh, on improving those and ensuring that we sow some seeds of doubt. Uh, and I think this contribution, um, as I said in today's times, is extremely interesting and important. There is an argument here for economic logic. Uh, yes. And you're quite right, I agree with you, that you know, into, if, if, you, if you go to Bavaria, for argument's sake, it is very much in their interests to have a simple tariff-free deal because they sell an awful lot of uh, motor cars that are made there. And we could argue the same for the regions of Bordeaux or Burgundy or um, Champagne. I or, have. <laughs> you know, and, yeah, you know, and again, they need... I, I think they sell us about 20 million bottles of Champagne every single year. So there are very strong arguments here. But, but, and here it seems to me, is the really big divide, perhaps within the Cabinet, within your own party, and certainly... Um, an angle that is being used by Mr Blair and Vince Cable and others. If Barnier and Juncker decide to hell with French wine producers, Belgian chocolate makers, German car manufacturers, we're going to put what we see as the political interests of the union ahead of economic logic. If we get to a stage where they're asking us for ridiculous sums of money, they're demanding the European court still has a say, is no deal better than a bad deal? No deal must be better than a bad deal. That If you take the logic of your argument, say they wanted a trillion pounds from us and said that we must remain within the European court for a 25-year transition period, no deal where we didn't have to pay them a penny would be better than a bad deal. That is obviously true. And they need us. The great advantage of our leaving is that we cease to protect inefficient uh, continental industries. If you just take solar panels... Uh, the reason solar power is so expensive and heavily subsidised in this country is because we put a huge tariff on photovoltaic cells from China to protect an inefficient German industry. We can make energy cheaper, lower subsidies. We can do the same for food, clothing and footwear once we're out of the customs union. We ought to be focusing on the really positive aspects of leaving the EU, which benefit most of all the poorest in society who spend a bigger percentage of their budget on food, clothing, footwear and energy. Well, I shall look forward to your uh, party and your cabinet being united and being positive in the autumn, although I'm rather sceptical as to whether they will be. Now, Jacob, um, on this show, uh, we've seen over the course of the last few weeks, particularly, um, Mog Mania, or is it Mog Momentum. I mean, I've got a, a tweet here, Moggy, 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 in, 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 and there is this wave of popularity coming, this now trendy old Etonium that people are rallying to, and yet, and yet, maybe that's not the case inside Westminster, where I see that this week you didn't manage to win uh, the chairmanship of the Treasury Select Committee. So are you more popular amongst the public than you are in Parliament? Well, I lost the chairmanship of the Treasury Select Committee to a highly qualified former cabinet minister who will do an extremely good job. Um, uh, popularity in politics I is very much here today and gone tomorrow, as you know. What, what I think matters, and I might begin to sound like Tony Benn in this, is the issues and not the personalities. And that what is important, and here I very much agree with you, is that we ensure we get the best deal over Brexit and that we genuinely leave the European Union and that there isn't some dodgy establishment stitch up to keep us in to the great cost of the British people. And anything I can do to contribute to that, well, I want to do. Well, it's interesting because Ian Dale, who, whose show is on before me, has been to Downing Street today and interviewed the Prime Minister. And one of the issues that came up was that of Jacob Rees-Mogg. And perhaps you'd like to listen, Jacob, uh, to how that little interview went. Raka Shah from Rotherhithe wants to know, when will you give Jacob Rees-Mogg a cabinet job? <laughs> Jacob is a great colleague and uh, he makes a huge contribution in the House of Commons and he's always, it's always worth listening to Jacob's contributions in the House of Commons because the, the, uh, he's a great history buff and uh, you learn an awful lot when you listen to him. 
That was the most nervous, prolonged laugh I've heard her utter since she was asked in the election campaign whether she thought Nigel Farage should go to the House of Lords. I mean, Jacob, they don't want you, do they? In, in high command of the Tory party, do not want you in a senior position. Um, well, I mean, the Prime Minister has just been asked that question and has given her uh, answer. Um, and I'm a huge admirer of the Prime Minister's. I want her to stay uh, in office. I back her very strongly. We need stability. We need a period of calm. We've had um, some very exciting summers over the last few years, and I think we need a, a calmer, cooler summer, regardless of the temperature outside. The Prime Minister, as you know, is not a particularly fit or well woman, and she has a condition that she has to deal with. Um, if she was to go at some point in the next couple of years, for health reasons or whatever it may be, are there any circumstances in which you could consider having a tilt at the top job? If you look at the history of who becomes leader of the Prime of the party or of the country of a party in government it has never in its whole history been a backbench MP no uh, but, it's I, never, I think but it, it's never been it, Trump in America and it's never been Brexit and we're living in very different I, times I think it would be vanity on my part to think in these terms um, I want to support the government in getting the best deal on Brexit and getting us out of the European Union and in its other ambitions I want Mrs May to carry on uh, doing it um, I have very few personal ambitions that being the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset was my life's ambition. But I am now going on Test Match Special uh, at Headingley. It just is the icing on the cake oh, I've of done a it life's myself, I, yeah, but I agree. You, you know what but, I mean. But, but, Jacob, it's all well and good you saying that. But actually, in the course of the last couple of weeks, we're seeing a bit of a re-smog rebrand, aren't we? Because you're now on Twitter. You're now on Instagram. I mean, this is a very 21st century Jacob re-smog now, isn't it? Well, I don't think it's much of a rebrand. My first entry on Twitter was in Latin. It has to be said, <laughs> uh, one of the most obvious um, quotations that I... I I use the dictionary of quotations greatly, and the one I used comes under A for anonymous, so you don't even have to get very far into the book to find it. Jacob, I think some people will be listening and saying, actually, there's a bit more ambition, perhaps, with Jacob politically, but on a personal level, um, and people are interested, you've just had uh, your wife, and your sixth child, who you've named Sixtus, which, which certainly um, attracted some attention. Can I ask you, how's the nappy changing going? A nanny does it brilliantly. <laughs> right. OK. So you, you're on Twitter, you're on Instagram, but you're not exactly modern man, are you? I've made no pretense to be modern man. <laughs> at all. Ever. <laughs> so, I, I, I'm probably as modern as you are, though. Have you, I would, that, that may be true. <laughs> have you ever changed the nappy, Jacob? No, I haven't. Right. I don't think nanny would approve, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. I don't think she'd think I'd do it properly. And bear in mind that this is the nanny who's worked for my family for in September 52 years, so she knows a thing or two about doing it properly. And what's it like? Suddenly, you're now, you've gone from being a political figure, you're suddenly becoming a bit of a cult figure. I get huge feedback about you on this programme, and some people love you, and others, of course, don't, and that's how it goes. Um, how are you coping with fame? Oh, it's all great fun. Politics is enjoyable as well as serious. I've always thought one should take pleasure uh, in politics uh, and enjoy the bits of it that are amusing. The, uh, Private Eye had a wonderful selection of names that I sh should give to my next child, and, and I think of those Moggy McMogface was my favourite, that, that there are <laughs> uh, amusing parts of politics and one shouldn't be too po-faced about it. No, I agree with that. And Jacob, summer holidays, are you going abroad, are you staying in the UK? No, Somerset. Somerset. Where very, else could one wish to be? Very good. Well, Jacob, thank you. And as I say, it was the Latin Master's end of term report. Uh, Jacob, very <laughs> upbeat about the Prime Minister and the government. He's certainly very loyal, if nothing else.